All right. So uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, uh, and I wanted to uh, welcome you all to our kickoff seminar for the School of Public Health's uh, Global Health Seminar Series this year. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. John Kaler as our speaker. He is a UIC alumnus uh, receiving his medical degree from the College of Medicine and has had a distinguished career in pediatrics, including more than 30 years practice at Cook County Hospital, and then is the chief medical officer for a large federally qualified health center in Chicago. For more than 25 years, Dr. Kaler has also been interested in global health and has participated in humanitarian work worldwide from Mexico to Haiti to Tanzania. In 2016, he dedicated his time to the Syrian diaspora in Jordan, Lebanon, and Greece. And after returning from Syria, Dr. Kaler retired from his clinical work to dedicate his time to building a humanitarian organization concerned with the needs of the displaced. Um, he and his collaborators established the international NGO Med Global in 2017. Since 2018, Dr. Kaler has been responsible for the Med Global Project in Colombia, serving the needs of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. In partnership with the international NGO, Global Response Management, Dr. Kaler is establishing clinical presence at the Mexico-Texas border. His journey and the state of the refugee crisis from Venezuela to Mexico will be the focus of his presentation. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Kaler. All right, well, let me thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to uh, help kick off this year's academic program, um, but it's kind of a strange honor. Um, I'm at the end of my career, obviously, and all of, the, all of those of you folks who are starting a career have significant choices to make. Um, it was very interesting to, to be invited because I'm not a researcher, so this certainly won't be a discussion on my latest research. I'm not an academic, although I've taught for 20 years in the Department of Family Practice at Cook County Hospital. I'm not an academic, so this isn't going to be a traditional grand rounds. So I'm trying to think to myself, well, what, what is it going to be? So I figure that what I am is a collaborator. I'm an accompanist. I go to where things need to be done. So this will be some form of a testimony, some form of a witness that, at least from a man who shows up. So there are a couple of slides that are about to be shown that are, are graphic. Um, please be prepared for them. Their import is that um, they help me tell my story a little bit more. Uh, they'll be relatively short, but they are relatively graphic. So please, first one is next. Um, as the introducer said, I have been traveling for 25, 30 years, mostly short-term interventions, go with a large organization, stay for a couple of weeks, come back, pat myself on the back at what a great guy I am, and then go along with my work. That all ended in 2010 with Haiti, began to focus me more, I was in, lucky enough to be in Port-au-Prince within a couple of weeks after the crisis, stayed for a couple of weeks. Um, very, very moving, as you might imagine, helped focus me more than anything else had. But what really changed my life was uh, the Syrian crisis. Um, revolution began in 2011, of course. And then in 2013, there was the uh, Assad gassing of a uh, suburb of Damascus called Ghouta. Uh, killing at least 1,750 people, at least 1,250 of those were children. This slide shows on the left, the last two scenes of a uh, of, uh, 60 minutes presentation about the uh, catastrophe. And what the last scene showed was children uh, lined up in a um, warehouse, uh, like cords of wood, just as you see there. And this picture on the right is a father uh, with his wife in front of the shrouds of five of his children. And he's about to explain to his God, how could this happen to him? Um, this touched me at a place I have no idea how to explain what it was. And um, there's still not a week that goes by that I don't have 
this picture in one of my dreams. That was followed when I was in Greece working on Lesbos Island, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Syrians, the third wave of the Syrians coming across the, coming across the water from Turkey. Um, this is Alain Kurdi. This is September 2015. And um, this picture obviously went worldwide uh, on the web. It went viral. Uh, condemnation from, from all over the world. And its effect was actually basically zero. Or still goes on, the bombing still go on. Um, although there were a lot of changes of um, um, social media outlines on your, on your um, picture, this actually was basically zero. But with it, I happened to be in um, Greece and uh, working with another organization and a colleague of mine, Dr. Zahir Salou, who was the president of that organization at that time, came over to do a site visit. And this was just as um, the siege of Aleppo was beginning. Um, and so I said to Dr. Salou, I said, why don't you send me to Aleppo? Let me go. Um, there'd be no better person in the world than me to go. I'm an old white guy that looks like Santa Claus. I have no Syrian blood in me whatsoever. I can stand in solidarity and bear witness to the West at what's happening in this crisis. And he said, uh, no, 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 it's too dangerous. We can't do this, we can't do that. But those of you in the audience that do know me know that I can be a pain in the butt for a lot of times. And after, after oh, a month or so, I convinced him for us to go. And this is Aleppo, this is a, a Mayad mosque built in 1250, uh, now completely destroyed. The front line was where you see those white domes in the back. Um, this, we, we happen to be privileged to be the last Westerners before the um, siege closed over. And when we came out, um, we decided that we wanted to set up an NGO that dealt more with global crises that are continuing along and not just in Syria. Uh, I mean, I had spent a lot of time in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, but we had wanted, and, and, and Zahra, of course, was deep, and it still is, by the way, in Syria. And so we decided to set up an organization by global. With that, I said, well, we don't have to go 6,000 miles to find a crisis. We've got one that's you know, only 2,500 miles away. And at that moment in time, this was in uh, December of 2018. At that moment in time, there were probably 25 to, 50, 25 to 30,000 people coming across the Simon Bolivar International Bridge between Pachada, Venezuela, and Norte de Santander, um, Colombia. And this is that bridge. And this is at that period of time. And what they're holding up are, are their cedula, are their, are their identifications. And, you could get an identification and a um, uh, pass essentially to go through and to come through um, uh, and spend a day to a week uh, on the other side of the border in Norte de Santander where there were supplies that were beginning to be in short supply. And so um, I can't outline, I feel like an outline, I can't. You may see if you look at about 10 o'clock at the venezuela colombia border, you'll see uh, uh, the word Cucuta and San Cristobal. Well, that is the border. That is, I mean, that is, that is the nexus of legal migration um, from Venezuela through uh, into Colombia. Um, with that, we set up our clinic there uh, and began. But let me take a couple of moments to put Venezuela, the Venezuelan crisis and in in our, our work there into a little bit of uh, perspective. Um, there's no question that uh, the Venezuelan migrant crisis is the largest uh, humanitarian crisis in this hemisphere. Uh, there's no question about that. Approximately 6 million, as of now, approximately 6 million eight um, Venezuelans have left the country. Um, this, from the standpoint of absolute numbers, is exactly the number that is in Syria also. Difference between Syria and um, Venezuela is that most of these refugees at first were well received in their host countries. So they would come across 
um, approximately 5 million seven uh, are housed in Latin America and the Caribbean. And as I said, at first, uh, they were very well received. It, it just so happens that the beginning of the crisis, there's several categories. And I, I figured I'd lay them out this way. I'm not, they don't literally go in this order because there's all of these at every time. But I'll show you a slide that, that kind of lays out why this is important. So the initial diaspora started in, in uh, 1999 when uh, Hugo Chavez um, uh, won the presidency in Venezuela, began the Bolivarian Revolution, um, pledged uh, a socialist democracy. And of course, those people who ran immediately, all those people who had money and were going to be affected by this. So the first group is most of the, in this type of a crisis, the first group that leaves are those who can, the first group that leaves are those who are moneyed, and this is the source of your, of your large um, diaspora in Venezuela and Madrid. These are the moneyed folks that are trying to fund the ongoing um, um, drama in Venezuela. Second group though began um, um, in about 2013 with the death of Chavez, um, and the Doros rise. And if you notice the dates, this is also after the 2008 financial crisis. By now, um, by now, oil prices have begun to deteriorate. So, so the economy was in a, a negative, a negative spin, and so it began to affect those who are always most affected, which is the poorest. And so now, because. Colombia and Venezuela had one at one time been the same country in Gran Colombia um, before the split. At one time, there was a lot of cross-border uh, legality. When Venezuela was down and Colombia was up, um, the, the, the uh, exodus went the other way. So at the border, particularly at a place like Norte de Santander, there was always, there's always Venezuela and Colombia mixing. There's a lot of cross passports. So it was, it was a, a good relationship we had. So a group, the first group of people that came across, the border was still open. The first group of people that came across were itinerant. They came and they lived, they worked the, the, um, the black market, they, they, they sold goods, they, sold, they, sold, um, they worked in factories, they could go back and cross um, um, to, to. So it was kind of, it was a good relationship for most people. Um, in addition to that, uh, the Colombian government, um, T16, um, gave temporary protective status, essentially, they call it something different, but it's temporary protective status um, to those Venezuelans that were already in the country, and they were able to register for, for um, social services. And that ended in December of 18, um, as did uh, e easy border crossing. Because by now the uh, um, the Colombian government and the Venezuelan government were having significant problems um, with with violence a little bit further north, and the Colombians accused the Venezuelans of housing the ELM. Um, the whole the whole area was becoming a, a narco control territory. There was a lot of fighting for things going on, so the Duarte government uh, closed the border. So now there was no longer this easy ingress and egress. And so in about 2013, so the, the population I told you that went and came, most of that group was called those Pantelaris. What they do is they go and come. They, they literally go in, they get, they, they get supplies, they go back, they come in, they get, medica they get medication, they get hospital services and go back. Um, starting though in 2017, what would happen is the group that came across started to come across, um, not the bridge, but the river crossings, they call them the sloches. And the majority of those that came across um, didn't come across to stay in Norte de Santander, but came across uh, and began a journey south. So in 2017, the journey was south. They would come across and they would start walking down to Bogota, which had been by far the majority but they would go on to Brazil, on to Ecuador, and into Chile. Um, and then comes COVID, um, and you get what's reverse migration. There'll be more, there'll be two more slides that elucidate this. You get reverse migration, all the borders are closed, the economies are dead, including the um, um, 
underground economies. And so people realistically said, well, if I can't, you know, if I can't work in a factory here and I want to be poor here and I can't do anything else, I might as well go home. So at least 150,000 people came back north and went back into Venezuela. Now, obviously when they went into Venezuela, things were no better for them, but at least, at least they were home at that time. And then finally comes, um, uh, comes April of, well, it's actually February 2021. And for some reason, the Colombian government decided that they were going to do two things. No one understands why this is in the, this moment in time, unless Duarte saw God. I'm not sure why he did either. Was that um, they did two things. They said, well, we're going to give temp 10 year temporary protective status to any Venezuelans who are in Colombia as of December 31st, 2020, um, and can produce their papers and document that. We'll give them a 10 year temporary protective status. The other thing we're going to do was because of the crisis with um, um, Los Caminantes, those coming across and walking, that in addition to that, then we're going to set up a set of sanitaria, we're going to set a set of public of, of health clinics um, from Norte de Santander all the way down to Bogota and down to the border at Ecuador. So um, these were to be, they would be intermixed between large multi service. Uh, multi-service clinics and smaller ones where you could just get a, you know something to eat and stop and rest. Um, the first one that was set up was in, in uh, right outside the about six kilometers from the bridge in an area called Los Patios. And because of our um, reputation uh, in the community, we were asked to serve as the medical presence in that clinic, which we did. Um, finally, with the election of uh, Election of Petro and um, Petro and um, Maduro uh, setting up again, reestablishing diplomatic relationships. Um, these these corridors changed a little bit, and I'll show you a slide to exemplify that. And finally, um, the border will officially be open to vehicular traffic as well as uh, foot traffic uh, all along the border as of September 26. People are waiting to see what that's going to mean, of course. Um, most of us on the ground feel that what it means is going to be an increase in Venezuelans leaving the country. I mean, nothing's better. I mean, it's better to strike that. The economy is certainly increasing if you've got dollars and you live in Caracas, Maracaibo, any of the big cities. Uh, if you're a banker or, or someone who needs to wash money, your life is good in, in Venezuela. If you get outside of Venezuela, get to any of the favelas, get to any of the, the poor communities, they've seen none of this happen. So when you hear people talking about how much better things are, it's only better for a very, very small community. Um, so another way of putting what was going on is that Maduro intended that there really is no problem. There's, 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 there's no major problem. There are problems. Most of those are caused by the sanctions put on by America and the West. There are problems, but, but we're taking care. No, 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 no. That measles outbreak that you saw really didn't happen because we vaccinated everybody. No, 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 no. We, we took care of eliminating malaria 20 years ago. So these malaria cases that you see dying uh, in the understaffed communities really aren't happening. We're, we're on top of this. Duque in, in uh, Colombia said, well, there really is no humanitarian crisis. There's a problem. And a lot of these folks coming across the border is a problem to us. It's causing us, you know, causing us some stuff. But there's no crisis. And the reason he says there's no crisis, because once you really declare a humanitarian crisis, the UN and WHO, everybody else gets involved. And there's a whole bunch of things that you have to do. If you don't declare a humanitarian crisis, and yet you go to the, the big funders, um, w, I mean, to the World Bank and things like that. Those funds come to you. So now the funding for the for the humanitarian work comes through the president and not through the large agencies. And the president can determine where that money goes. And so so Duque says, no, nah, 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 there's no humanitarian crisis. Now that Petro is uh, elected, uh, Petro and Maduro get together, handshake, and they say, well, let alone there's been no problem. The problem's over with. So let's uh, fix the economy. So virtually 100% of Petro's uh, efforts right now 
No, and he's just he's just too lost. It's not like he's anything to be done by now. But 100% of his efforts are at economy fixing. We were told at a meeting in Bogota not long after he was elected, but before uh, he took office, so his, his front people, that there will be no more money for medical humanitarian response. All the money is going to go to uh, uh, um, fixing this economy. So another way of looking at it is from 2017 to 2019, as folks came across the, the, the Venezuelan border, either, either legally or through Las Rochas, they went south. They, they went to Colombia houses by far the most, they, but they did go to Ecuador, they went to Peru, they went to Chile. This is a, just a picture of, of the clinic that, that we were able to establish uh, in Norte de Santander, in Cucuta, in the Maid area, um, to take care of uh, itinerant Venezuelans and Los Pendolares, meaning people would come across. This is probably five kilometers from the border. So it was easy to get to, it was easy to get to, and um, um, as you can see, it was if I would have blindfolded you and put you in there, you couldn't tell me you were in that little village or Pilsen or somewhere else. I mean, it was a real, was the only multi-service clinic for Venezuelans uh, in, in that community. I at one time, you know, it's, it's had to be OB day because it can't be that many pregnant people. Uh, but uh, in 2021, um, I will say that we cared for 20% um, of all the Venezuelan women who delivered at the Mills Hospital, which is the you know, general medical hospital, tertiary care hospital, it's a public hospital that, that serves the, um, Venez serves anybody, but this is where the Venezuelans would cross the border, literally just to go and deliver at this hospital without care, without care. And the other thing that I should say right now for my public health colleagues down here is that there is a, a significant problem with congenital syphilis in this area, significant problem with congenital syphilis. And it is a public health um, urgency. And um, both we, uh, in conjunction with the Mio Hospital, are setting up programs to try to deal with this. Um, this is a picture of what it looked like at the height of uh, Los Comandantes walking. Remember, this is the Andes we're going across. I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't a hill in uh, uh, Grant Park. This is the Andes we're crossing. And so um, you've had a significant number of deaths with this, and you, the disability is beyond, beyond discussion, of course. And what would happen, the reason, uh, to go back to that discussion about the sanitaria, what happened is that every little NGO known to mankind would set up a tent at some corner and do a little bit of this, or a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And so, what the Duque government said was, "We're going to take care of this. We're going to we're going to we're going to clean those small players out." Of course, I imagine the big players end up with significant contracts, but we're going to clean those small players out, and we're going to um, um, set up real sanitaria to take care of them. And as I said, there were six there were six large ones planned with smaller intermittent ones. One got built, and that one, as you can imagine. Uh, the government built it, gave it to 12 NGOs to run. And so you can imagine, you can imagine what happened with that. There's no gas, there's no nothing. So they're in the process of changing that. So comes COVID-19, people go the other way. They go back into, go back home, essentially. This is a picture, this is, this is Los Patios. This is the picture of um, the first of the larger sanitaria. Uh, this is before it opened, of course, because you can still see uh, um, bureaucrats wandering around. I will say one thing. I, I will say one thing. I didn't put the pictures in here, but what you see there was a field two weeks before you see this picture. So they decided to do something and put this stuff up in a matter of a, matter of a couple of weeks. So I guess some things can happen. Then comes 2022. This is, this is uh, an important thing. So... What happens now is that with the borders open um, and after the election, uh, both Petro as well as, as Biden, people decide to go north. Now, I don't have it on here, but what you do see happen, so the picture here is just of the Venezuelans going north. But what you do see happen is that the folks from Chile, from Peru, uh, from Ecuador decide it's time to move. And so they start moving north, okay? Um, there's several reasons for this. You know, we have to put this all over the large umbrella, of course, of 
of the pandemic and its effect on finances. We have to put this now over the whole outline of the Ukrainian war. So there's a whole bunch of things that lead to where we're at right now, but there's a few that I just wanted to highlight, and they're both pulling their, their, their pull factors and push factors. Well, the pull factor, of course, is that um, um, Biden's victory, okay? With that victory, the word went out via social networks, you know, so all of this is, all this network is deep and deep and wide, that Title 42, is the Stephen Miller resurgence of we're going to keep people out by pretending we're really concerned about COVID crisis. So we're able to return people back that they're going to stop Title 42. And for those who wonder, it still isn't stopped. It was stopped, I think, for a long weekend. And then somebody flipped it. And of course, that uh, migrant protection protocols were also going to be stopped. Migrant protection protocols are what is the stay in Mexico program. Okay. That, that these things were going to be stopped. It was going to be uh, a new day in North America. Uh, and suddenly we will be, you know, everyone's going to be received well. Three factors were exactly the opposite, which was after January 6th, everybody was aware that the big money was on the Republicans taking back over. And there was no question that if they took back over, they wouldn't play around like Trump played around, like Stephen Miller played around. They would shut that damn border down. They'd be militarized, they'd be shut down. No one would get across. Second thing was that now we have to put this into the world refugee crisis mode because now people are coming from all over the place, right? They're coming from Eastern Europe. They're trying to figure out how to get up from South, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. Everybody is moving and everybody's, everybody's still thinking, well, we got two years. 2022 is coming. We've got at least two years. And so if we're going to move, it's time to move now. And that's exactly what happened. So now on the refugee, on the, on the massive refugees you'll see coming, you've got uh, mostly Haitians, a lot, of, a lot of Africans, Middle East, Chinese, Russian. They come from everywhere. And the reason that that happens is the, is the last thing on the push is that suddenly what used to be a cottage industry of some old guy that, that you know, in, in Laredo that actually knew you know, his way to get through the desert it would take 25 people across. He'd get paid for it, drop the people off. He'd pay his tax, of course. There's always bigger fish that needed to be fed. He'd pay his tax, of course, and then go back and take the next 25 <clears throat> With this increase in numbers, with this increase in numbers, the coyote is no longer involved. This is big time uh, cartel trafficking. And with the cartels come exactly what happened with the narco cartels. These are ultra violent folks uh, that have literally no problem um, killing competition and fighting the competition. So the same routes that used to be traveled by by a guy to make you know a couple thousand dollars in a year have gone up to in the multi-billions of dollars. This is how much this is worth. And this is why there's very little control of it anywhere through. You know, this is the type of money that pays people off. <clears throat> this is actually a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this is a little bit out of sort. This is actually the crossing. If you see it up there, this is the, the crossing from Guatemala. Uh, into into Mexico. This is Tapachula. Now I'll come back to that. It's a little bit out of sync right now. All right. So folks are coming north. There's two ways to do it. You can you can ambulate. That could be on bus, walk, whatever. Or you can take boats. Um, um, the, the cartel, depending on how much money you got, will uh, take you either way. So to put this in perspective. Um, let me just say that when we first started in, in uh, Colombia, we were told by people starting to make the route that it was somewhere about between three and five thousand dollars, depending on how much bus work you're going to do, how much walking you're going to do. The estimate yesterday that, that I heard was this is up to now for that route, um, eight thousand dollars, and for the route up the Pacific on a boat, twelve thousand. 
So that's the change in, in um, um, loss that's happening. So this is Darien Gap. This is the first, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the, the first choke point you see um, if you're ambulating. This is about a 60 kilometer wide area. This is, by the way, this is so bad. If you wonder how bad this is, this is the only place that the Pan American Highway stops. Even they didn't try to build a, let alone when we stole the, when we stole Panama to build the, the, the Panama Canal. Uh, they still weren't able to put the, the uh, Pan American Highway to them. So this is the only place the Pan American Highway doesn't it stops. It is all jungle. It is run by very, very dangerous uh, uh, cartels uh, and takes about a week to two weeks to get through. People die, many people die in here and stuff like that. Um, as, as those of you who solve public health problems by thinking outside the proverbial box, I will tell you that I am in the beginning of a discussion with, uh, I won't mention who they are, uh, an international group to actually train the coyotes um, um, first aid, things like that. I mean, this is, this is essentially, there's a lot of, as you can imagine, I'm sure no one in this room will be surprised, there's a lot of moral outrage, uh, but this is very analogous to, to uh, needle exchange program. Train the people who need to be trained to do what they need to do. Okay. So this is the first choke point. This is the, so you come out of here and you're in Ecuador. I'm sorry, you come out of here and you're in Costa Rica. Next choke point um, is at the, <clears throat> at, at, of course, the Northern Triangle, Honduras, El Salvador, um, have been problems with migration uh, for, for a long, long time. And as people are moving north, they're picking people up uh, in these countries to come forward. So the next big choke point is at the Guatemala-Mexico border. <clears throat> and there's three crossings. The first one is Tapachula, which you see in the, at the Pacific. Uh, that's the major one. There's two more in the jungles, but they're very, very dangerous, and very few people uh, go through those. Tapachula is that choke, choke point. We, Tapachula is the Mexican side. We have a clinic uh, at that choke point. So everybody goes through that. Um, say goes through there. So if you remember a few years ago in 2015, 2016, uh, when Trump was going out of his mind about the about the invasion of uh, you know the caravans are coming and they're going to invade the southern border and all this. Stuff. This is where they began. So when you saw pictures about the caravans, you know, coming, this is this is where they were. Once they get through there, it's just a matter of distance. Everybody comes out of top of Chile boats. Everybody goes to Mexico City. Okay. Once they go to Mexico City, they make a decision uh, which way to go. Okay. It turns out now that, uh, or it had been this way, I'm not sure what's happening literally right now, but that uh, a significant number of these people would drop off and stay in Mexico City. So Mexico is having a um, increased um, numbers of, of, of immigrants stay there. Uh, all cut, all tanks, Haitians and, and, and Latin Americans. A lot of staying there because there has been a lot of work in Mexico City. So they'll, they'll work it. Then what happens is they take, people tend to, you know, in this, in this tribal world of ours, people tend to uh, move with their own family for safety reasons, if nothing else. And there's four or five major crossings that see different, uh, different sets of folks. So going west to east, the major crossing in Tijuana, of course, still is mostly Latin Americans, mostly Central Central American folks. Well, yeah, they they go up and then they make their they make their breaks out. So in Tijuana, uh, there's a significant number of Latin Americans. Some of the Venezuelans are beginning to come there. As you move further to your to your to the east, the next major crossing is Nogales, Arizona. Again, a lot of Latin Americans there. So the two major crossing points for those coming from Latin America are Tijuana and Nogales. Also, Juarez has a large amount, and for some reason, in the past weekend, I don't have it on here, but in some in the past weekend there were Venezuelans in Juarez. Uh, One thousand of them came across in the weekend. Uh, walked across the, the, the Rio Grande is dry there, just like a lot of rivers are dry. They walked straight across and were turned themselves in, of course, to the uh, to the uh, border patrol. Um, were processed, 
and were cut loose onto the street. So there are literally 500 to 700 uh, Venezuelan bees, as we talk today, that are sitting on the street in tents. And oh, by the way, past weekend, they had drenching rain for the whole weekend. So we'll probably put that one in a little bit perspective. Uh, as you move further to the west, oh, oh one other thing about uh, the, the um, government in um, um, Paso just gave a $2 million contract to a busing company, to a bus company, to begin to carry these folks to New York, Washington, Chicago. So money is there, spent questionably. So as you move further west, you get, of course, I'm sorry, if you move further east, you can go all the way down to the end of the Texas border at, at um, um, Reynosa, which is on the other side of McAllen, and Matamoros, which is on the other side of Brownsville, um, that's where you see the Haitians cross. So I was in Reynosa a few weeks ago, and at our clinic, literally 85% of the patients were, of the people we saw were Haitians. Um, so somehow through social media, the word, word goes, and what you'll see happen now also, by the way, is that people will move from site to site just because they get word that more people are crossing here, more people are crossing there, the government's getting crossing here. The majority of the crossings, as you can imagine, don't occur in any of these. The majority of the crossings occur in the, in the desert, and the majority of those are in Arizona. Texas desert, so the majority of us are still taken across. This is big business. When, when, when we, there's a thing called the humanitarian parole. That's how you literally get across legally. So the, the lawyers will call and say, uh, we want to, uh, to have, we'll take 125 people to, you know, border patrol say that. Well, there's a queue and there's a, and, and people get to go. So, huh? There's, there's right now in Reynosa, there's probably 10,000 to 15,000 people queued up and they take 125 a day. So do the math, people are still coming. And so the queue is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is a uh, picture from last weekend at Reynosa. Uh, these are people that are lined up waiting to get on a bus to go on the Mexican side of the border to Matamoros because someone told them that the uh, Matamoros is taking more folks uh, across uh, than Reynosa. There are two major, there are two major uh, myths that are occurring right at this moment. One is that more money to lawyers will get your class faster. The second is that, and even more important than this, because if you see the wall on the left of that side, that wall is the wall surrounding a, a church. Uh, and in that church is a, an itinerant camp with perhaps a thousand people in it at most, somewhere in there. But what the, what the myth is right now is that um, the pastor, that pastor particularly, but other pastors too, have the ability to get people across. And so these poor folk, when I was there, it was 105 degrees. And they're living there. This is where they live. They're on the streets. There was a gunfight right outside here, and we opened the door to get people in to, to, so that they would be saved. Uh, 500 people came in. Gunfight is over. I'll think <laughs> Think of the problems of trying to get 500 people to go back to, to where they were. So as you can imagine, the tensions are, are heating up. These myths are going around about how to do things. But the other thing that happens then is that this is big business, as I told you. I, I gave you the figures on it. This is big business. You don't get the second half of your escrow payment until they get on the other side of the board. This is why, this is why the Haitians don't have as many um, don't have as many um, coyotes helping them as uh, Central Americans, because Central Americans get dropped off on the other side. So if they get dropped off on the other side, they can get the, they can get the second half of the escrow pool. Um, but what happens is that the cartels, so, so in Reynosa, there's four cartels that are controlling things. The Metamoros is only one. So it's a lot easier to deal with Metamoros. One guy would come and say, do this shit or don't do it, and you, you would or you would. You didn't mess around with it. And Metamor in, in Reynosa, they're fighting each other. 
So you don't know who to pay attention to at any one time. And we were told this is not, you know, it's probably better for everybody that you don't give too many of these paroles out and give people a cross ticket. So that's the type of thing that happens. Oh, and now, of course, as the buses come to Chicago, I had I had titled this initially Tachada to, to Reynosa, but I had to cross that out with Chicago because um, uh, now the folks, thanks to the lunatics in Arizona and Texas, now the folks are coming by buses without anybody being told. When I was in the calendar a few years ago, what would happen would be the border patrol would drop people off. You would get a call, we're going to drop 500 people off at the, at the bus stop. You'd go to the bus stop, you'd wait, you'd pick them up, you'd take them back to the, to the shelter. In the shelter, you had people that would, would be setting up the arrangements for where they would go. Well, now, a lot of these people have nowhere to go. Most of them have some place to go, but a lot of them have nowhere to go. So now you get bus to Chicago and somehow get out of Chicago to Burr Ridge, uh, and suddenly Burr Ridge is all <laughs> up in arms. Now, it's funny, if you read the article in today's Tribune, the mayor of Burr Ridge says, literally, there's been no problem. These folks are really nice. Um, as you can imagine, every restaurant in the in the western suburbs are there trying to get people, <laughs> trying to get people to work. You know. Uh, so we're gonna get them jobs, they're real nice, there's no trouble. And every one of them is both legal and cleared by the public health department, both in Texas and in the, in, in Illinois. But of course, we don't like it, and we don't want to see any more people come. So I, the, the, the moralizing around this stuff uh, continues. Let me just put it this way. And for anybody, for anybody who still holds the uh, belief that this isn't who we are, this is exactly who we are. Back from back from the the bans on Asians, uh, all the way through to you know. So this is nothing new, and, and, and is going to continue. So, in summary, let me just say this: I would be remiss. Since I'm an old man and you guys are just starting your career, I would be remiss if I didn't try to share something I've learned in all these years. And, you know, Dr. Paul Farmer, who recently died in his last book, and if you haven't read his last book, it's absolutely mandatory reading. All right, it's called Fevers, uh, Feuds, and Diamonds. It's a wonderful story about the Ebola outbreak in 2014, but even if you're not interested in that, read the last third of the book. It's the single best description of what happens when you are post-colonial but not decolonialized. Okay, it's the epistemology of how you approach these problems that's important. Absolutely mandatory reading. Uh, it's a tone, I will say that, which is why I said go to the last third. But, 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 but it's an excellent read. So his, his summary of things, of course, was that you need five things, right? You need, you need stuff, you need staff, you need space, you need security, and you need support. Can't get any easier than that. So that's on your final exam, by the way. We'll skip that. Um, so I've figured out that there are basically six principles that, that I've tried to live by. Um, they're from the humanitarian space, but they can be used just as well in the public health space. Number one and number six are by far the most important, which is that authenticity and humility are the two traits that you need to bring into every interaction that you do in the global health world. Every crisis is unique. Every crisis has its own set of sources and its own set of solutions. The six S's are the five S's I just told you about Dr. Parmas. You could put everything in there, but through a different time, a different place, and a different space. It's important, of course, to remember that this wonderful public, global public health world that we're talking about now is a direct descendant of the colonial space. Uh, we can't forget that. And of course, we God knows you can't turn the television on and forget it with the queen dying and all this stuff on TV. Uh, but it is a direct it is a direct descendant of the colonial space. The only reason the Londoners cared about malaria and that was to keep the white people, uh, uh, white folks in Africa healthy. Okay. There are lots come out of it, a lot of wonderful things that come out of it. And assuming as as this generation 
moves from post-colonial to decolonial epistemology, a lot more is going to come up. But number one and number six of those are hand and glove. Number two is logical, of course. Don't use language people don't understand. Break it down to the most the, the most understandable thing. Don't speak now, but don't think everybody understands what you mean by X, Y, and Z. Um, the third, though, is, is also an important one, and, and, and I know uh, Dr. Williamson and, and Dr. Murray have done this their whole career, which don't assume that caution is the best way to go. Sometimes you just got to stick your butt out there and take whatever comes with it. The Rothstein Center didn't get set up because people, you know, went step by step. No. They were, they were colleagues of ours went down and said, this has to happen, and money came forward. So there are times when you have to be bold. You can't be bold all the time when you just do a pain in the butt. I mean, you have to pick, you have to pick your battles. Uh, and of course, uh, four and five go together, which is that when you do when you're working in communities, pay attention to what the community is. These are these are a good way of of, of um, looking at these programs, understanding what um, uh, understanding how this refugee world works. But I would like to end this with a with there's something that should bring this home a little bit more. And this is obviously an old saw. Everyone in this room has seen this before. And it's, he who has a why can bear almost any how. This is Nietzsche. It's been given out to many different people, but it's an important thing to, to, to inculcate. But I want to play something for you that will bring this home a little bit more. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factories holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand that no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out. They smell strange, savage, messed up their own country and now they wanna mess up ours? How do the words, the dirty looks, roll off your back? And maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here.
leaves home unless home drives you away. Think about that feeling. I mean, it's frightening. Um, that is all I have to say. So if um, I think we have a few minutes left for questions, if anyone wants to ask. Yes, sir. So when we consider the change in the world, Small question. <laughs> as, as climate change happens and drives people north, what, what do I tell these folks? Open your hearts? I'm not sure. I, I, I wish I could answer that. Um, You've seen a scary version of it right now because just, please put these words into a context. One little war has dried up all supply, I have dried up all monies for everything else. And, and I don't mean it to diminish what's happening in Ukraine, but I do mean it to say that, that unless there's a turnaround in, uh, one's economic drives. Look, just take our board. Biden is afraid, Biden is feckless. He's afraid to do anything because 2022 is coming up and people will jump up and down about it. Uh, Stephen Miller is a fascist. So if he comes back in, this will be shut down and people will be thrown into cages. So even those of us who have enough money um, don't know how to center it to help you. I'll tell you, I'll give you one example and, and is that a recent fundraiser, the last, I want to say last weekend, but a fundraiser um, by Sister Norma, who's uh, any, if anybody, anybody who's worked in the uh, um, Rio Grande Valley knows Sister Norma. She's now the executive director of um, the Catholic Charities in Rio Grande Valley. She was so renowned that when, I forget which Pope now, one of the Popes came into a country and actually asked to see her. This is how, her, this, is, this is her import. She had a fundraiser and she was very, very happy with it. No question about that. Um, Goldman Sachs, um, I got to get the figure right. Goldman Sachs gave uh, $40,000. And that was wonderful, other than when you say that in the year ending in June of uh, 2022, they had a $120 billion profit, not gross income, profit. So take one billion of that, not they obviously don't feel the need to, or, or I guess we're not in a position to force them to. Take one billion of that, and your problems are solved in the southern border for right now. But the short answer is I don't know. Uh, infrastructure is nowhere near set up to deal with, with more calamities. Um, there's a current cholera outbreak in um, northeastern Syria. Um, what happens once cholera gets into the system? Just ask our friends in Haiti after the uh, after the UN was there. Um, so I'm exiting the stage, both literally and physically. Uh, uh, I mean, literally and metaphorically, exiting the stage. Much very depressed about it. I don't see answers. I mean, I literally don't see answers. I'm sure they're there, but I don't see them. Sure. Um, I just had one more curiosity question for your clinic um, and how the refugees interact with it. And how they interact with our clinics? Yeah. And I guess the, the potential that the clinics can play in serving as not checkpoints, but as like you can follow. Um, the well, system. by the way, that's a, I'm assuming you're not talking about our clinic that looked like a little village. I'm assuming you're talking about the, the sanitarium set up by the government to take care of the refugees as they're walking? Missed it. Um, you had like 
different clinics at different. Well, that's so. So let me let me the the the, the, the clinic we set up for us the Mac Global Clinic uh, was very well received. Um, um, it's a task to set them up in various places. But let me speak for a second to the collapse of the synesthetic, which were the which was the um, government's plan on helping Los Comandantes as they walk as they moved south. Okay, there's gonna be a series of those that look very nice on paper, except for one thing. The government set these clinics up. These people are walking south because of their government. And so as anybody who's worked in the field would tell you, they're not gonna stop. We were, they were initially set up to serve, I've got, this is an understatement, they were set up to serve maybe the big ones you could see 300 people. At the most they ever had 80 to 100. People don't mind, people are afraid of what, they're leaving their fear to government. And, and with all due respects, the regional governments were never any better than, than, than the local governments. So, so they did exactly what could have been predicted, which was they moved past it. And now the other thing they've done now is that they're between north. So all of this stuff set up, the plan to set up uh, to the south, COVID took care of that as well as the, the collapse and now they're moving north. So the answer to your question is depending on, depending on who sets the clinic up and what's its viability, um, um, will determine how the response is made. I will tell you that our clinics in, in Reynosa, in, in, in at the McAllen, um, um, Mexican border, are very well received. They're very well received. I mean, the, you got a small clinic with three locals and a couple of volunteers periodically, and 12,000 people waiting to see them. They're not just well received, they're over, they're over more. But thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, South, south to south or north to south uh, migration that we are very much related with the north, the south to north. Yeah. And there's a lot to say about it. And we are getting to know how we see our uh, internal. It's actually pretty much complex and pretty much difficult when it comes to how to, and how to try to to be accurate when it comes to the, the, the fundings and, and all the political things around. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I have a question, reflection maybe. Uh, I pretty much value when people share their experience in such a complex field like this, based on mine as well. Uh, based on your experience, how would you describe the level of organization, position in between, from one side, the local, NGOs, including the church yeah. and the local governments, I mean the local actors, and then the international yeah. stakeholders, including. It's an absolutely fantastic question because it is the nexus of the problem, or it's like that. It's the nexus of one of the problems, uh, in that um, the world remains post 19, the, the space remains post 1945 big donors, small recipients, even the language of beneficiaries, donors and beneficiaries. Uh, um, so the world, the, the humanitarian space sits locked in that world. And even though someone as good as Samantha Powers is trying to localize the money, uh, the USAID who is by powers of 10, the, the, the biggest contributor, 
trying to localize the, the, the money source, the money still are doled out from large organizations, small organizations. And so the, the nexus of attempts to change this global North hegemony is at that level. And, and there's plenty of people in Colombia working on it. There's probably no one in Venezuela working on it right now because they can't. But in Peru and Brazil, there's a, there's a ton of people working on it. But, but if you compare the sources by, by powers of the minimum 10 and maybe powers of 100, um, the, the differential is still there. Yeah, yeah so. Thank you very much. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.